As I open up, I want to first just commend you for the work that you do and the time you're spending in the education space deliberately. When growing up in Alabama, I had no real appreciation for how local and state representatives, senators, really impact my day-to-day -day life. I always thought that it was the federal government that had a major impact on our life, because that's what we spend so much time in the media. But whether the trash gets picked up or whether the school has the funding for doing what needs to be done, all of that's really going to happen at the local level. It's not going to be that much money or that much influence that comes from the federal government. And so with that, I also want you to understand that the implications of what I want to share with you today have long-standing um, effect. Growing up in Birmingham, one of the things that I realized today, and I can, I can um, prove this out through my Facebook um, social graph, is that everybody that went to school with me in the time that I graduated from high school, most of us do not live in Alabama anymore. Most of us live somewhere else. We live where the occupations are, where the careers are, where the opportunities are. We don't live in Alabama at all. And that was because of decisions and policies, appropriations that were made 20 years before we ever graduated from high school on what type of environment would be there by the time we graduated. And so we have to start thinking about today, as we look at this opportunity to really modernize education, what are the opportunities we're creating in your local economies, in your regions that are going to help students want to stay at home and continue to grow the economies there? Because what is happening now 20 years after I've graduated from high school is that the school system itself has about half of the kids that were there when I went to school. And you know the outcome of that. They have an infrastructure for a city that was meant for me to be there raising my kids, and we're not there. They have the, they're closing down schools that are historical schools because Alabama has a rich, colorful history, and that creates all type of strife but families who also went there and they expected their kids to graduate and go there. But it's about jobs, it's about opportunity, it's about careers, and that opportunity to decide whether Alabama was going to be at the center of that creative economy, whether they're going to be at the center of STEM economy, those decisions weren't made as effectively they needed to be made 40 years ago and 20 years ago. Fortunately, I can say Alabama has made those decisions in the past year because I was just there to talk about some of the things I'm going to share with you today. So I hold that surprise, but I want you to understand that the decisions, the time, the appropriations you make today have long-standing effect. They impact generations, and this is serious business, and I hope at the end of this that we can get to a place where the education committees that each of you all serve on, the funding committees, those should really be the largest committees in every state assembly, state legislature in the country because it's the only one that actually impacts whether we're going to have economic opportunity in those regions. So I'm passionate about it, and you will sense my passion and determination as we go through this. So beginning because we're talking about STEM and science, I want you to get this sense that for every high-tech job, every single one of them, Five to six non-jobs, non-high-tech jobs are created in your local economy. How many of you all knew that before I said it? Okay. These are not jobs where people are going out as engineers. These are jobs, these are the beauticians, the, the uh, people who are doing all of the non-high technical jobs in your community. There is a long economic tail created by STEM disciplines. So whether you have a scientist, whether you have a computer engineer or computer scientist come to your community, they are creating an economic wave behind them that creates jobs for everyone. Recently, the Bureau of Labor Statistics just published um, wages over the last 10 years of people who started in multiple disciplines. Education as a career for people who had a degree in education was the only career that had the least amount of growth. If, um, I think it was from 1993 to 2003 that the data shows that the salaries went from $24,000 a year to just over $42,000 a year in a 10-year span. But if you were an engineer in that same time frame, your career went from $33,000 a year to over $75,000 a year. in that same time frame. 
And the top three careers were all STEM careers that saw the most significant growth in terms of economic output, in terms of income in that same time frame. So we have to start thinking about not only can we help students really think about STEM as an exciting career, but it's also one of the most creative careers that we have to think about. And so when we put this in context today, I want you to be really mindful of that as we move through it. Now I'm using two different monitors, one so that you, uh, for those of you who may not have had everything working for you on your tablet, you can see it on the screen. But for those of you who have tablets, you should be able to see the magic I'm doing happening right in front of you, almost as if I'm there beside you. Uh, I, I will add that this technology we're using, if you all are on nonprofits, Microsoft just made an announcement last week that this is actually free for you. This is like cool, cool stuff. This makes me happy to work at Microsoft. And if you can't get it for free, we so grossly discounted that even if you had a bad drug habit, you could still afford it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really cool stuff. So the times that we live in, next year, 2014, No Child Left Behind, the full measure of the federal law is supposed to go into effect. Most of you all have been applying for waivers. Any of you all know about the state waivers going on? Okay. Because so, the, the full measure of that law is that in 2014, 100% of our students have to make minimum or exceed minimum proficiency on their state assessment test. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you all have been adopting Common Core state standards. I have never seen Common Core state standards or any type of education standards implemented and test scores go up at the same time because no one's been teaching those standards in those previous years to prepare students for the rigor for the assessment. And more importantly, most teachers in America have not seen the assessment. So there won't be any teaching to the test this time around as we get to 2015. So we have to make sure that the curriculum is going to be of sufficient quality, of sufficient rigor that students will be successful when they challenge these assessments. Along with Common Core, we have Next Generation Science Standards that were also um, ratified just this summer uh, in July. And these new science standards, about 24 states in the union, 24, 26 states in the union have decided that they want to adopt these standards. We've got a lot of flux happening in our education system as we really rethink the curriculum standards in which we're measuring ourselves, our states, the funding we have against, in order to make sure that our kids do better on these international benchmarks. Now I see a lot of tech companies, whether they be in oil and gas, chemistry, et cetera, like to beat Americans across the head with our placing on the uh, world stage with reading, math, and science. It's a little disappointing when you see those um, things kind of repeatedly over and over again. It's like, we suck, we suck, we suck. Then why are you putting commercials on television five seconds after the other for that? But the reality is the test, the test that most people don't know about is of 15-year-olds, um, sophomores. When we get those rankings that are where the U.S. stands on reading, math, and science, we're saying that the 15-year-olds in other countries are better than the 15-year-olds in the United States. Because when they get to 15 in other countries, they're expected to know everything they really need to know so that they can go to work. They're not waiting till they graduate their senior year of high school to build that confidence. And so we need to have some urgency about the time frame that our students, by the time they get to their sophomore year of high school, the rigor in their sciences, the rigor in their mathematics needed to have been a lot more compressed than what we currently have in order for them to do better on those international ben benchmarks as well as on the benchmarks that we're going to be doing here in the U.S. locally. Because the time frame to compete is going to be very different than where we are right now. So I want to cover the trends that Microsoft sees in education. Microsoft sees in technology and Microsoft sees in the world that really prompt the urgency of this time frame that we're in. And I'll go through these um, spending some time more on others and less on some because you'll have all of this content to review. And I'm freely available on LinkedIn, Twitter, email, phone, however you prefer to communicate to follow up on any of this stuff, we can do that. But let's start with society. And in the economy, too many of these um, remotes working at the same time. There we go.
there's a line of sight thing going on with this. You notice that? It's like you have to use the force. All right. So on the world stage, we know that things change um, big time. It was fine when we were more, everything could be bought and sold in the U.S. and we could compete amongst states and that was fine. But the world now, especially since this Great Depression uh, or a Great Recession, I'll, I'll rephrase, that we just went through, or in some cases some people may still be going through depending on what you look at for economic indicators. Um, this has changed the way we think about the way the U.S. sits in our global context. An earthquake in Japan that causes a tsunami that creates a radiological disaster impacts the price you pay for technology here at home. A generation ago, that wouldn't have been the case. We would not have seen that type of linkage between events that happen in one part of the world and what happens here. Whether we decide if we want to bomb a country in the Middle East or not is going to have an impact at the pump. But more importantly than the impact at the pump, it's going to have an impact on the price of a gallon of milk because we use petroleum products to make the actual cartons that milk comes in. And so it, before people can even put gas in their cars, they're paying more for the food that they consume to get to the grocery store in the same time. All of these are related to the sciences that our students need to study. And we also know that as more and more people in our rural growing parts of the world, whether they be in Russia, whether they be in China, whether they be India, they are moving from their rural communities into the cities. And new construction is having to be facilitated, new energy has been needed to be produced in order to facilitate the growth of these mega cities that are happening back and forth around the world. And even here at home, as we look, some of your states, depending on, you should do a check yourself, find out how many patents have been filed in your district in the last 10 years. If there haven't been a lot of patents filed in your district, there may be a problem. Because in the state of Texas, my re rephrase, the sovereign nation of Texas, um, we've had over 300,000 new residents come to Texas in the last three years alone. And the reason why people are coming to Texas is simply because of the economic opportunities that exist in our three largest cities, in the greater um, Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area, in the Austin-San Antonio corridor, and in the greater Houston area. Nobody's moving to West Texas, except for my nephew, because the military is sending him there. But the, um, for the most part, West Texas is pretty much done. And nobody's really moving to East Texas. People are moving to the cities where they're seeing opportunities around a lot of creativity, a lot of um, economic growth, and where the major technology companies are. And there are correlations between these things that we have to think about in your local regions if you're going to be successful in growing what's happening for you. Now, on the workforce side, um, some of you all are baby boomers. I get that. A few of y'all may be in the Gen Y, Gen X club. But for my boomers, I have a bone to pick with you. You won't retire. You won't quit. You won't die. <laughs> You're holding up jobs that my generation has wanted for a longer time. And there are not many of us in the Gen X generation. We were the first latchkey kids. We were the ones that came home from school, and our parents weren't there, so we tend to do things a little independently because we had microwaves. We didn't need someone to cook. We figured it out. But our millennial siblings are far many than we are, and they are not prepared to take the mantle of leadership and responsibility that you will create in your wake in the vacuum as you do retire. When we look at engineers, we know that it takes 18 years to produce an engineer. Becoming an engineer is not a phenomenon that happens when you decide on a major in college. It happens from your earliest experiences as a child. Um, some may argue within the first 40 minutes of birth. Some may argue by the time you're three years old. But it happens very, very early in your academic career. And so we know that if a group of kids start kindergarten, and there are about 3.7 million kids that start kindergarten each year at the same time. By the time they all go through the cycle to graduate from college, only 167,000 of them actually graduate. Of 3.7 million, 167,000 graduate from college on time. Of that 167,000, 
only 67,000 of them are actually engineers. All of the experiences that needed to happen in their lifetime that were either missed or failed experiences are contributing to the fact that we are not producing a pipeline of folks that are going to be able to take on the fact that most of our boomers are in that engineering range because we haven't had a massive boom since we sent a man to the moon. We're at another Sputnik moment where we need to be able to produce a larger cadre of engineers in our community, and we haven't been able to meet that demand. But over the next 10 years, we're going to see uh, about a third, I believe, of all of our engineering disciplines retire, and we don't have the people to fill them. Now, at Microsoft, you, we may ask, why do we care? Because it's not like we're going to hire all of them. At any given time, there may be 8,000 vacancies in our corporation that don't go filled. But as a company, Microsoft has this global network of partners that contribute over a half a trillion dollars annually to the global economy. Most of that right here in the U.S. And for all of our partners, for every dollar we make, they make six to nine dollars. It's a really, really great business to be a partner with Microsoft. And so those partners, too, need to have expertise. They need to have talent so that their business can continue to innovate and support the clients and institutions that they serve. But also the institutions you work in. I'm pretty sure when you walk past an office at the um, State House, there is somebody using a Windows machine. They, they don't just set themselves up. Um, not yet. We're working on that. But the, um, there's a whole industry that is supported, whether in healthcare, whether in medicine, whether in other industries that are non-partner industries with Microsoft, that use this advanced technology that we have to think about. We don't have the workforce to support it, and we need to be able to make that happen. The interconnected pieces of our economy is really becoming more entwined as we get more of the network of the internet going back and forth. But we're also seeing through things like social media that the Arab Spring that we had just a year ago, that governments can change because of the way that we're connected now. And we even see that change here where people can organize, whether it be political parties or whether it be movements in the U.S., the information that happens is a lot more volatile than it used to be. Now, as we move into the technology arena, um, one of the things that we look at is that there are about 1.5 billion people on the planet that use Windows like you have in front of you right now. And of that 1.5 billion people, they're having a, a great experience, and we got a, a, another billion or so using Microsoft Office. But there's 7 billion of us on the planet. And so in order to reach that next 5.5 billion, we have to think about different ways of interacting with the computer. It can't be touch, it can't be just keyboard and mouse, and it can't be just voice. It has to be something that is far more natural, far more elegant, and also that preserves the cultural identity of that um, location or wherever we're going around the world. Because there are lots of cultures that are actually being eliminated from the face of the earth simply because so much technology is done in English. And so as a company, we have to think through those things. So how do you preserve the identities of culture as we become more and more advanced? But I want to share with you, as we think about this natural user interface, just a quick video from Microsoft on the things that are changing. Because w the ultimate goal here is not for us to have to adapt to the machine but for the machines to really adapt to us. And it's going to help us close the gap on getting more students trained, getting more students educated, and making it easier for our educators to be effective in the classroom. We're at a shift in the paradigm where computers will no longer strictly be used by graphical uh, interfaces, but increasingly will be used in a more natural way, where the same human senses, speech, vision, hearing, you know, will allow the computer to, to interact with us at a higher semantic level. My goal in life is to find out how to design technologies that work for people and which fold into our environments in a way that's transparent, seamless, but ubiquitous. It's there when you need it and how you want it. The potential for the, uh, for the natural user interface work that we're doing here is in some ways to liberate people from technology. We don't want people's interaction with technology to be driven by the technology, but to, to be driven by the tasks that they're trying to achieve. We are remaking the, the way we relate to computers, and so there's a lot of different choices that we can make. So it is very important to come up with something that is fluid, works well, is usable, and is productive and fun at the same time. 
avatar plays an important role in the natural user interface paradigm. It allows a user to interact with computers as they do with other human beings. I think it's a very exciting time at the moment to see um, you know, just how human-centric we can make that technology. Pretty soon we're going to see some of the things that we've, we've seen in science fiction and it, it won't be so hard. In our vision, we can make the human-computer interaction more engaging and fun. The major change that we're entering into is a transformation where we're paying attention to the device, to the gadget, to the service, whether it be your phone, your slate, your desktop, to where you're starting to see the ecosystem. Because with ubiquitous computing, digital technologies invading almost everything we have, the way in which people will interact with computers will be more like they interact with another human being. And as a result, we can have a whole new expectation of what we can ask the computer to do uh, and the kind of help that it can provide. So in that video, you saw a whole range of things that require science, a whole range of things that require engineering. You probably looked at them first from a consumer point of view, like, why can I have that right now? So in many cases, you probably already do. It may be technology that you have on your phone, or if you have an Xbox with a Kinect, some of that technology is already there. The Kinect can determine what mood you're in and react differently. And the new Kinects that we have coming out this holiday season, they'll even be able to determine your heart rate when you're working out to a fitness game so you don't have to even have a chest strap on you to know what your heart rate is. That, for me, is a little freaky, but I'm going to try it out. Um, and so as we think about this engagement of how we can move things from where we are today to the next, Microsoft Research is really um, breaking barriers on how we do that. The avatar that they talked about is a, is a technology I'm particularly interested in as it relates to literacy. Because we found through um, research that we did in 2005 and 2006 that students can learn just as effectively from an avatar as they would a classroom instructor. As long as that avatar looked like it could follow their eyes and had some gaze recognition that it was looking directly at them. Also, if that avatar was the same type of, um, had the same cultural identity that that student had, they would feel like they were speaking and working with somebody that was connected to them. But what's different about having an avatar versus an educator in this context, and do not mistake me for saying we're going to get rid of educators and just put avatars in all these machines, that's not the, the, the mission at all, um, is that a computer can know things that a teacher would never be able to know. For example, it will know the difference between a page being read and a page being turned. It would know the difference between a video being watched and a video being played. It will be able to interpret whether or not a student is reading fast b um, by the eye movement or whether they're finding s um, parts of the text that are troubling for them and they're not actually going back to do any type of deductive reasoning to infer from the text what the content is actually about. And so we can do things with technology to provide significant amount of scaffolding to improve literacy, to improve language art skills for a lot of students in ways that we haven't even imagined before. As we think about the role of devices in this context, we need to think about um, a lot of your states have already, and you probably have it in your education funding appropriations, to um, put devices in the classroom, and you've been buying tablets. Any of you all been in this whole tablet boondoggle? So I said we were all about makers and creators. All I'm going to say about this whole tablet mix is this one thing. Apple doesn't make iPads on an iPad. They make them on a real PC. Google doesn't even design Chromebooks or Android devices on a Chromebook or an Android device. They design it on a real PC. In fact, for Google, uh, on their own website, when they want to hire people to work in their finance department, they expect them to have expert skills in using Microsoft Excel. And so these companies are pushing technologies into K-12 education that they don't use to make the things that they make. It's the bottom line. The tablets you have in front of you, some of you all have Surface Pro. I believe you have a Surface Pro right here. This looks like a tablet, but that's a full-blown computer. That's a real PC. If you want to run Photoshop on it, if you want to shoot a home movie, or if you want to shoot a uh, movie for 
for Disney, you can do it on that PC. If you want to record an album and have it completely released, you can do it there. Or if you want to do great engineering work and architect a bridge, um, I think there's one up in um, Minnesota, somewhere on I-35 that had some issues a couple of years ago that we could, we could get some engineers on. You could do it with that tablet. I-35 is a special corridor that runs through my neck of the woods in, in the sovereign nation of, of Texas. So we have to think about those kind of things. The role of the device should not be a consumption device. And it's not consumption versus creation. It's about how do we help students explore their curiosity. It's about how do we help them explore their creativity and make sure they have all means to do that. And the final piece on this for us is really thinking about how the, we move to a place of universal access. The cloud is important. But this universal access is far more important to me because when we get to personalized learning, it doesn't happen unless we know exactly what's going on with students. And for us, this means that we're going to have to have a policy debate about privacy. We're going to have to have a deep conversation about privacy as it relates to students and their learning. Because where we are right now is that we have students basically in shards across their school districts and even in their home life. And as we think about blended and um, blending formal and informal learning, not all learning takes place in the classroom. In fact, most of our learning in life is going to happen outside of the classroom. But our schools today don't have the wherewithal to actually blend the rigor of what happens outside of the classroom into a complete record for that student. And it, this is an area that only with universal access and being able to manage identities across all of our students and deal with the privacy implications that come along with that that will move us forward in that regard. So that brings us to this last place of where we are in the modern learning context of the blended and formal. Uh, my daughter, she's 10 now, she's in the fifth grade, but when she was going into the third grade, she had a course at TCU to focus her on um, English language arts during the summer. And it was a great course, wonderful experience for them. Same rigor we would expect from a university of that caliber. But nothing about that course was known when she showed up at school in the fall. In fact, she ended up repeating much of the work that she had already done during the summer because there was no way of identifying exactly what was the mix between the two. And so when we think about our libraries that we have in the communities, our museums, we've got a lot of great things that we have with our aquariums and zoos where students can actually have deeper hands-on experiences, connecting those real-world experiences with what happens outside of the classroom to what happens in the classroom is the next holy grail. The digital content revolution is not about electronic textbooks. That's only a portion of it. When we think about publishers, we also have to think about the authors. Most of our teachers in our classrooms across the U.S. are not using textbooks anymore. They're actually finding the resources that they need to teach on the Internet, and in many cases, printing them out and handing them to their students, or they're authoring them themselves. And so you have both authors and curators that are not thought about oftentimes when we talk about the digital content revolution. So it's not enough that our textbook initiatives um, just go back to changing the money from a physical book to a now a, a book on an electronic screen, but thinking about how all content is going to be consumed and used as a, as a ma manner of um, instruction. I'm going to talk about employee, employability and readiness in just a moment as we wrap up with um, IT Academy. So this is what this all boils down to from a Microsoft perspective. We have this notion of how do we create economic empowerment for all of our students, regardless of their zip code, regardless of where they are. Now, we're biased. We have this incredible bias that if you're in the software engineering arena, that you're going to have a successful career. It's, it's a good bias to have. Mark Zuckerberg would agree. I'm sure Steve Jobs, if he was still here, he would agree as well. But the, the opportunities for jobs, as I stated earlier, even if you're not in the high-tech field, there's still a, a great place for you to get career work. Any of you all play Angry Birds on these smart devices that I see some of you all in, in the classroom? Classroom. Angry Birds. Anybody not know what Angry Birds is? Because I have been in some, some audience with people don't know what Angry Birds is. Okay, Angry Birds. I, I'll give you a brief, brief glimpse of it. It is probably the most... Um, silly game you'll ever see. 
Um, but it's about a group of birds who had some pigs steal their eggs, and the birds are angry because the pigs stole their eggs, and they're going to attack them. He has a demo that he can show you of angry birds. Okay. Um, there's a lot of physics and a lot of math and geometry you can learn by playing angry birds. However, what I'm more interested in in Angry Birds is the story behind the app. Um, when it began, it was actually not called Angry Birds. It was, it was like mad pigs or something. And um, the birds weren't cute. They were very ugly. But it was only five people who designed and came up with this notion of Angry Birds. When they originally wanted to put it in the Apple App Store, Apple would not give them the time of day. And so by word of mouth, they told people that they had this cool game called Angry Birds, and it became popular in their home country um, of Sweden. And then after they moved on to, they called Apple back, and they said, can we get this feature in the store? Apple said no, so they said, all right, fine. They went to Finland and got it to word of mouth, and it got to number one in both countries simply by word of mouth and people playing the game. After it was number one in two countries, then Apple said, okay, maybe we'll feature it in the store. Fast forward, in less than a year's time after that moment, you cannot sell a digital device on any platform unless it actually has Angry Birds on it. doesn't matter if it's an iPad, an iOS, an Android phone, a computer, even Xbox has Angry Birds on it. Everything is running Angry Birds. They have created this tremendous economic tale from five people that wrote this game. My daughter has Angry Birds um, robes, bath robes, so that she can... Uh, after she gets out of the shower, this big pig is on her head every night. And there are all types of betting. Quote, These are industries that had nothing to do with the actual science and engineering that went into the game. But the licensing of that engineering, of that creative event, is now spread out across so many different industries that it's created economic opportunity for other people. And this is the part that we, we need to really go back and celebrate because as we teach students about entrepreneurship through STEM, then they learned that everything they possibly needed to know to take any job, they would have gotten if they had a, actually had the skills to create something versus just having the skills to get a job. So let's move forward here. With our vision is simply to get us to this place where no matter where we are, no matter what we, d we are doing, we can learn with whatever we have in the appropriate context with the appropriate rigor. And so there are two things that I want to focus on to close this out on. Shape the Future is one of Microsoft's programs to get devices in each of um, your students' hands across the country. And this is done to make sure that the cost of that device is done at such a um, great value that that is no longer an economic barrier that we have to consider. And so um, our folks here that are from our, our SGA team can provide you with a lot more information on what we have on Shape the Future. My ask for you today is around Microsoft IT Academy. Um, in Alabama, I told you that they had made some decisions to bring me back home, and this is one of the decisions that they made. And when I met with Governor um, Bentley there for the announcement on it, this was a big deal for me personally because nothing like this existed when I was growing up in Alabama, and it hadn't existed in the last 20 years since I've been home. There was no um, program, there was no concerted effort from the um, state legislature or from the governor's office to make sure that students had a post-secondary credential. Now, in my introduction, you heard that I'm a non-traditional student. And this IT Academy is part of the reason why I am a non-traditional student. It didn't exist when I was in um, college. I actually started college at UAB right after I got out of high school. But in my first year of college, I had three car accidents where I totaled the car three times. First, the second one was in a brand new car that I hadn't even paid the first month's note on. Uh, so by the end of that three years, neither Allstate nor my parents wanted to see me behind an automobile, <laughs> which was the precursor of me joining the Air Force. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you, you can figure that out. However, uh, while in the Air Force, it was a Microsoft IT certification that I was able to pursue and get. It was that same certification that I had when I became a CIO at two different school districts. Had not finished my undergraduate degree, but I knew certainly more about anything that was going on in technology than anybody else in the, in, the, in the city and the community. And it was that same certification that was the only credential besides my diploma that I had on my resume when I came to work at Microsoft nearly 10 years ago. 
by the time I actually finished my college degree and my MBA, both of them were not as necessary for me to pursue a career path as I, as I was at that time because of these industry credentials. We're going to have students that have life interrupt their plans, whether it be through a car accident uh, or multiple car accidents, whether it be through love, whether it be through uh, other aspects that interrupt life's plans to finish a four-year degree. We need to have alternatives for them to have them ready for the world of work. The IT Academy program takes us back to that place where I began, that if you, 10 years ago, if you were making $33,000 a year, 10 years later, you're making $77,000 a year. There are not very many industries that would have given students that same type of opportunity. And this is a world-recognized credential that we provide to school systems. Two states here already have IT Academy programs. The vast majority of you do not. Some school districts in your state may have an IT Academy program, but you really should think about an appropriation in your career in technical education to make this broadly available, not only across all of your high school students, but also your middle school students, so that when those middle school students get to high school, they're ready to go, because remember, the 10th grader in the country they're gonna be competing for jobs with was already ready for work before they showed up in high school. And so this gives us an opportunity to go deeper and much further in the space that we have here. Um, super fan of that. And it is, it's because I was of this um, certification that I was able to pay for my own schooling without having to take out any loans. And so you, you need to really think about how the economic empowerment of one particular program stands out above the rest. The second ask that I have for you is around computer science. Every high-tech job that you have in your city creates five other jobs. If you want to attract computer scientists, if you want to attract creative people, you need to be actually doing things that facilitate an environment to make that happen. By making computer science a graduation requirement, you're creating an economic driver in your local region that will help your students stay there. Because I know at the end of the day, you can't do anything in your state without tax revenues. And if the tax revenues leave like I left Alabama and everybody that graduated around me left Alabama, this becomes a problem. Those are revenues that could have been right there in Birmingham helping our school system continue to flourish and continue to grow. And most of the people in the country, you see that they are clustering. There's clusters in, the, in North Carolina in the Research Triangle. There are clusters in Texas. There's clusters in California, especially around the um, Silicon Valley. There's clusters in Washington State. But if you want to change that clustering effect, you have to change the focus around computer science. This is where the math, this is where the science disciplines can be really expressed and explored in magical ways. It's not just about kids being able to write computer programs. They may decide that they want to create the next Angry Birds because they want it to become a television cartoon. They may decide that they want to do what um, James Cameron did where in making Avatar, there was more technology that had to be used in the back end in order for you to feel like that 3D effect was very real and very crisp for you. And it was a way ahead of his time. The technology didn't exist before he made Avatar, but a vision to tell a story, to tell a narrative, prompted that production of that technology to be used. So in every field, in every endeavor, software, computer science, has an opportunity to improve the quality of life for folks, and this is one of the reasons we would advocate that that become a graduation requirement in your state.